Timothy B. Tyson, author, historian, and joint professor of history at both Duke University and the University of North Carolina, published Radio Free Dixie in 1999. This biographical nonfiction work introduces readers to the powerful, though often controversial, civil rights leader Robert F. Williams, offering a broad look at the cultural factors that facilitated his rise to prominence during the mid-20th century. American Civil Rights Movements Tyson first explores Williams's early life and the factors that influenced his interest in fighting for civil rights. In 1936, as a young boy in Monroe, North Carolina, Williams once played witness to the public assault of a black woman by a white police officer. The officer, Jesse Helms, attacked the woman and led her away to be raped. Williams remembered the scene for the rest of his life and often attributed it as the chief experience in the development of his black consciousness and political philosophy. Enlisting in the army during World War II, Williams found himself conflicted by the supposed moral obligation of the United States to forward the cause of democracy in foreign lands while stateside, black people had little access to the domestic democratic establishment. He also had serious problems with the racist treatment black soldiers received, especially veterans who were accosted for seeking equal rights upon their return to the states after risking their lives in the war. His vocality toward the racist structures in the military ended up earning him time in the brig. In the fire of the heightened post-war racial violence, Williams began to separate his brand of activism from that of the mainstream NAACP sanctioned nonviolence. He advocated armed self-reliance, in which black people, as a final resort when provoked by violent white people, should consider it their right to use violence to defend the lives of both themselves and their loved ones. The law, Williams argued, did not do much to protect black citizens from racial violence, so when threatened with death, black people should consider it their duty to stand and fight. Tyson is quick to point out that though Williams embraced violence as only a final response to racism, this by no means meant that he was a long-suffering pacifist. To the contrary, Williams, following the Bay of Pigs fiasco, sent a telegram to Senator Adlai Stevenson requesting an array of military-grade weaponry and defense funding to aid black people in their cause of overthrowing the racist tyrants who have betrayed the American Revolution and Civil War, though offered almost tongue-in-cheek and more as a critique of the federal government's aid to foreign rebels while ignoring the rebels in the states. Williams no doubt believed that the potential existed for the civil rights movement to evolve into a full-scale black rebellion. This belief became reality in 1961 when Williams and other black citizens led an armed standoff against the Ku Klux Klan in Monroe. The FBI, which had been eyeing Williams for some time, and the powerful white supremacists more or less forced Williams's hand after the situation dissolved, and he expatriated to Cuba and then to China in order to preserve his life. While abroad, Williams began producing and broadcasting the radio program from which the biography derives its title, Radio Free Dixie. The weekly program, which aired just before midnight on Fridays and was syndicated nationwide, featured music and commentary that focused on black issues, offering support to those in the Jim Crow South. Following the end of the show's syndication in 1965 and the easing of diplomatic tensions with China, Williams returned to the United States in 1969. After a short stint of legal trouble that caused him to be extradited for trial in North Carolina, Williams eventually settled in Michigan and lived a relatively quiet existence until his death in 1996. Tyson's interest, though, is not just in the facts of Robert F. Williams's life. Rather, he paints a picture of how the dynamics of post-World War II culture and the oppressive structures present in the Jim Crow South coalesce to produce a figure like Williams. The Cold War and the global struggle by NATO countries against Russian communism facilitated an environment of resistance stateside, and Williams was left to negotiate the tension between a federal government that both saw the need to expand equality, while worrying about appearing too Marxist in doing so. Tyson also reminds readers that Williams's ideology turns the generally accepted chronology of the civil rights movement on its head. The Narrative of Martin Luther King, Jr. S. Nonviolent approach to activism preceding and, in some ways, leading to the rise of the militant skewed black power movement fails to remember that Williams was more of a contemporary to King than to later leaders such as Malcolm X. For readers unfamiliar with the civil rights movement and especially the more militant ideology that often undergirded it,
Tyson's Radio Free Dixie could act as a general primer. I hope you enjoyed this video leave a like if you did and be sure to subscribe thank you.